midterm release tonight, so I'll post that out on Piazza when that's available, so I'll have access to that. And the uh, TAs, undergrad TAs, will are setting up awesome uh, review sessions for you to help you uh, prepare for the midterms. Any questions on that? Good CAPTCHA test. 
So would it be something like if I said, what is uh, 5 plus 10? <laughs> is that a good capture test that distinguishes you from a, an automated system? Why not? Yeah, so computers can do that really easily and really fast, right? And probably better than you can. Like if I gave you a complex division problem, right? You would probably use a calculator, which is a machine, to do that for you, right? <laughs> And you can think of actually, and we'll probably get to this in a, in a little bit, but CAPTCHAs are essentially a type of uh, authentication. And what is it specifically trying to authenticate? Are you human? Yeah, are you a human or a computer? So what, what are some types of CAPTCHAs that you've seen that may be more effective than a math problem? Yeah? A bar slider where you have to put it in a certain degree of range. A bar slider? Like what? I a shadow on a page where it says move the bar to where it is. Oh, interesting. Okay, so like a picture or something? And it's like shadow and you have to like draw a slider somehow on the shadow or something? Yeah. Okay, so you're using essentially uh, image recognition, right? You have to understand what it's asking you to do. You have to understand the image and see where they want you to play something based on that. Yeah, what uses that? I don't think I've ever seen that. Uh, Chinese captures for oh, like cool. cryptocurrency. Interesting. Awesome. Uh, what else? Any other types of captures? Yeah. I think like Google uses like tweets a photo that has a stop light and it follows or something like that. <coughs> yeah, I can't remember. I don't know if that's reCAPTCHA. I think that's built into there. But yeah, they'll show you a bunch of different photos and say mark all the photos that have a whatever, a sign, a car, or whatever in them. And as you mark them, they'll keep showing you more and more. weird like uh, and maybe like with squiggles or something in it right so it'd be like what is this word here which you can actually barely read um, <laughs> right so the idea is maybe a person would be able to determine this but it'd be much more difficult for a machine yeah these are kind of the original text based captures uh, there's also another type of recapture that's super interesting that shows you text uh, snippets from a scanned text, like a book or something, and then has you fill in what word it is, and they usually give you two answers, one that they probably know and one that they don't know, and so uh, they're trying to test you on one and build up their vocabulary and trying to better train their algorithms with another. Um, any other ones? Yeah. There's one recently that I saw where it had an image and you had to rotate it until it was uh, like the right way up. Oh, cool. So like, uh, I feel like those are like tests I took in grade school or something. Like <laughs> how to rotate an image and what would it be if you rotated it. Um, yeah, okay, that's cool. So image rotation, yeah. Aren't there ones now that are like invisible that kind of keep track of how you're moving the mouse around the site? A little bit. I wouldn't necessarily call those captures. They're more like yep. browser fingerprinting or pager <coughs> fingerprinting to try to determine if you're a human or not based on what you do. These are more like, I think captures are more like test based. Like here's a discrete test That's definitely part of what's used to authenticate you. Yeah. Those are owned by the recapture people. Like the click on the stop signs. Mm -hmm. You get more of them based on like how robotic you've been moving around the site. Interesting. Okay. So yeah, maybe they add other information there. Yeah. Um, auditory ones. Yeah. So there's other ones, right? For maybe people who are visually impaired, there's uh, audio-based captures. Um, so how good are captures at preventing automated?
Yeah, so if you, uh, probably I think the best example of this was uh, like Ticketmaster because they got in, uh, they I think sued some automated ticket buyers. So they have a captcha on ticket purchases. And um, so what they found is that A, so it's easy to break. You could pay somebody a penny to break it. And if you make $20 off of buying a ticket and then reselling it later, that's totally worth it. So you can pay people to break them. Um, you can even do what they call, uh, it's kind of like, a, so some of them you can just break. So actually it turned out Ticketmaster, they were doing uh, word-based things. But if you refresh the page enough times, you'd see that there was like 2,000 different images and they would rotate through them. So you just download all those 2,000 images, break them by hand, and now you have an automated system that can just immediately break it. Um, they also use a technique called uh, <coughs> CAPTCHA, maybe arbitrage or something. So the basic idea is uh, we'll use Ticketmaster. So there's Ticketmaster, uh, which is protected by a CAPTCHA. Right? So when your automated system goes to access this, it throws up a CAPTCHA. So what you do as the bad guy, so you're, let's say this is your box. Uh, you have an automated system that goes there. Uh, we'll call this CAPTCHA C. The bot goes ahead and has probably paid for, so the trick is how do you get people to break captures for you by either paying or not paying. So let's say there's a, uh, uh, I don't know, free online streaming site. Whatever, sports, whatever you want. So a free online streaming site that either the bot controls or they paid somebody. And before uh, a user who is a human visits this site, it throws them a CAPTCHA, but they have no idea that this CAPTCHA is actually the one from, um, from Ticketmaster. And so they solve it so they can see the free video streaming or whatever, usually illegal or whatever content that people can't get normally and for free. And so you solve the CAPTCHA and little do you know, it's now fed into some automated system and you solve the CAPTCHA for Ticketmaster, not for this site. So that's a way to do it. There's been research that's been shown that uh, even if you can't break, so the earlier image ones are easy to break, and then um, what they ended up using was using the audio system. You could break the captchas, and then it got to the point, I think, where you could use Google's own like uh, audio systems, like audio listening systems, to break their own captcha systems um, because the machine learning tech had gotten so good at that point. So. Um, Anyways, a uh, bit of a tangent, but interesting <coughs> authentication mechanism here. So yeah, we can definitely think about adding these to stop maybe uh, lower tier kind of attackers or automated systems, but it's not gonna stop a dedicated attacker, right? It's worth their time and investment to solve or break your captures to break into accounts, they're going to do this, right? And figure this out. Anybody ever see this on Google when doing Google searches? Yeah. Yeah, when do you see that? Okay, overseas VPN, where else? <coughs> you're, getting, you're at ASU when you're on the Wi-Fi? No? Okay, I guess it's just me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because we all come out at the same IP address, so Google's trying to do some detections on how many searches we have per IP, and at a certain point you can hit that and you'll start getting these captures like, prove to us that you're not a robot. Um, when you're like, I, you know me, Google, you have 10 years of emails, like, <laughs> what are you doing? Um, Cool. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, this would be one mechanism. What else could we use to try to uh, combat? So we talked about this a little bit. Uh, we can try to maybe deny access to our hashes, right? So don't give out the hashes and passwords, uh, so that we can prevent online attacks. But again, this is very difficult to guarantee. This is kind of the theme of this whole class. You can never really under uh, assume that a system is 100% correct secure, whatever, there's always an avenue where somebody could maybe try to steal um, your password hashes. <coughs> uh, we talked about delay, so we can type in a delay when things do this. Um, this definitely happens. Is there anything else we could do? The captcha, we talked about that, what else? What's that? Yeah, maybe, okay, so that's interesting. So that, yeah, we could maybe, uh, require policies of users so that their passwords are not easily guessable or found in a dictionary. Uh, one way we might do this is do our own password guessing attacks 
on their passwords, and if we are we are able to break them, we would tell them to change their password. Um, this becomes a little tricky as to we talked about all the problems with that, right? Of if now a user is have to then create a special password just for your site, that's because your requirements are different than the password they're used to using. They're much more likely to forget your password, so there's problems there. Um, there's problems of even if no matter how complex the requirements you make are, users will use the easiest password that they can get away with too. Um, and attackers know this and can figure this out. Um, yeah, so it's difficult, but yeah, that's definitely a, a great way. What else? Yeah? I haven't actually seen anywhere that does this, but you could ask for increasingly more information. So the first mm -hmm. few times you ask for the password and then like, oh, you've gotten it wrong five times, so now we want your password and uh, your recovery email or something like okay, that. Okay, interesting, yeah. So you could maybe do um, <coughs> maybe additional types of authentication. So after failing a few times, uh, have more pieces of information to try to tie their identity together that maybe an attacker doesn't have because they're just guessing passwords. Uh, what's that? Oh, 
six point six times ten to the eighth. So six times ten to the eighth. Uh, fifteen. No, sorry, fifteen. Yeah. Cool. So we can get actually a huge increase in the search. <coughs> Our users actually going to be users aren't actually choosing a random password from this search space, right? That's why searching is so effective. So we can do dictionary search, right? So uh, it just means that if we, so if we search for dictionary words, right? And we just had lowercase, we can just look for every dictionary word lowercase and try to guess the password that way. Um, but if we require an uppercase letter, then we at least have to take every letter in the dictionary and transform it into at least one uppercase character. So you're making the work more difficult for an attacker. And then further on with the numbers and special characters, so you're just increasing the work that an attacker has to do to try to guess. Yeah. Um, so I've seen like most of my friends, um, they store their passwords on the first letter is capital, then it's lowercase, then they follow by numbers. Mm -hmm. And I think if all the, if most of the users follow that pattern, it's just... But do they? Yeah. That's the question. Do the users follow that pattern? Like there are some patterns, but yeah, so it all depends on the, on the system. So, uh, you know, it's, I guess I'd say it's strictly better than not having that in terms of guessability. Um, it can be much better to think about, we talked about passphrases a little bit, requiring very long passwords can be good, except that users aren't used to doing that. So they may not have a passphrase that they know at the ready of what to do. Um, because yeah, that's the other thing. If you increase the exponent here, you can get much larger search space and that can, uh, you know, even with all lowercase letters, if you have a huge 30 character passphrase, that's gonna be much more secure than, unless the attacker then knows that and they look for dictionary words. So that's the other tricky part. There was a hand. Yeah. Even if an attacker were looking for dictionary words, if you had like a 30 character password, that's like, I don't know, maybe four or five words. Mm -hmm. Now you have a screen that you can randomly choose any word, mm -hmm. the amount of words in the English language to like the fourth. Yeah, how many yeah. words are there in English, though? So. Uh, I have no idea. It's very large, I assume. <laughs> Is there a way to actually put Webster's dictionary? Can somebody look it up? I I don't have a system that has it. Though. We'll go with that, but that seems like a lot of words. Especially if you think like what words our users going to choose. It's probably going to be maybe. A, I, let's go with twenty thousand. Is that fair? Have you ever taken those tests to figure out how many words you know online? No. Yeah, it says that people use between twenty and thirty thousand. Cool. Thank you. That sounds good. Okay, so we'll use twenty thousand, right? So we think. Okay, so then what's so twenty thousand words? We have let's say three choices for a three-word uh, guess. So how many guesses is that? to the third. 20,000 to the third. I guess that's still pretty good. What's that? Eight uh, trillion. trillion? That's trillion. We're just on the order of where we were with lowercase and uppercase. So it's actually not that much because uh, we'll see, depending on how fast you can guess, this is actually not a crazy search space. Yeah, that's, that's the tricky thing. So if somebody knows your password does this, right? Four characters are going to give you a lot better um, guessing. And, it, and then if you add other things, like if you started adding capitalization, like capitalizing the you know, different words of your uh, of your passphrase, that would be much better too, right? Yeah, but once you start adding capitalization, it becomes increasingly harder to remember it yourself. Correct, so correct. Unless it's like a lyric or something, but then you could also look, you know, if people started using passphrases in earnest, 
attackers and start figuring out what are those common passphrases and those kind of things. Yeah. Why did you raise that to the three? Was that like implying a three-word passphrase? Yeah. Okay. So this would be the search space for a three-word password randomly shows it in English. It's also not a phrase, so maybe you could also narrow the space down depending on what actually makes sense for three words. Cool. Okay, so one other technique we can use is we can make it, and this is kind of the fundamental problem of having online versus offline attacks, right? We can do everything we want to the login function, but if somebody breaks into our system and steals <coughs> all of our hashes, they can run their own computation locally, right? So we talked about, um, it was either Tuesday or last week, about adding salt to hashes, which can help so that attackers need to break each password individually. Um, but we have, um, but we have this fundamental problem that actually, and by, so when we talk about cryptographic hash functions, do we want those to be slow or fast? super cool things about password guessing is we can, so if you think about, okay, you're an attacker, you have, so we talked about, and actually it goes into these, right? So we have, uh, we want to guess all eight character passwords, right? You're an attacker, how do you do this? Right, it's a brute force and attack against crypto algorithms. some way to um, split up the full in input set mm -hmm. and then just do a bunch of them in parallel. Sure. Or what if you didn't want to do that? What's the simplest way? Just do them all in a row. Yeah. Just start with all lowercase a's, change the last letter to b, c, d, e, all the way up to z, and then change the second to last character to d, and do a, b, c, z. You just search through all possibilities, and then every time you do that, you then take that password, you hash it, and then you compare it with the hash that you know or are looking for, right? And you know that if that character is, if that password is in the um, this search page, if it's an eight character password that's all lowercase, you will find it eventually, right? Then we can talk about other techniques to speed this up, right? We can distribute this computation. We can maybe use all the cores on your machine. So if you have an eight core machine, with maybe 16 logical cores of hyperthreading, you could have you could split the search space up into 16 and each search through a different part of that search space. Um, if you leverage machines like on Amazon, you can spin up a thousand machines with four cores each and get four thousand cores that are all searching through the search space. So you can search through it four thousand times faster. Um, you can use your GPU, which is able to do computations like hashing very effectively in massively parallel systems. Um, so you can do that, all these types of techniques, but fundamentally you're, you're computing and you're going through the search space, right, all A's to all Z's, computing the hash and then comparing it. Could you do this without doing the computation? Yeah. Don't they 
have hash tables? Or they already have the hashes for commonly used passwords. Yeah, so why not store all these passwords or all these hashes, right? So you actually have the hash, you've already done the computation. You store it in a table that says this password maps to this hash. And then later you can trivially break. So this is kind of a classic example of a speed versus storage trade-off, right? If you store the results of your computation, you can actually reuse that later to break other people's passwords. Uh, what's the problem here? What if your hash is a uh, So then we now have this problem 
Where, okay, this is actually, so we know that we can create these tables that can break passwords very quickly if it's MD5 all lowercase, or sorry, MD5 alphanumeric up to nine characters. Um, but our rainbow tables and the even the hash table for here, right? So we have every password and we have to calculate the hash of the password, right? So this is only if the authentication scheme is actually going to just hash the password, right? Can we break that? So how does that change now if we have salts to this password? When you add the salt link to the password link? Yeah, so we need to, now we need to hash the salt uh, and the password, right? And now I can't just do that here in this example of 13 terabytes, right? Because it's not just 26 to the 8. I also have to do this for every possible salt. So depending on how big your salt is, that's going to significantly, you need to essentially need to create a rainbow table per salt. Uh, which is gets to be prohibitively expensive. Um, so this is why salts come up in many different scenarios. One that we saw of just being able to easily tell if we had the same password, uh, but also in terms of brute force guessing of passwords. Now, if we uh, we can't just use one rainbow table and break all MD5 passwords, we have to actually um, we have to create a rainbow table per each unique salt, which is going to get insanely expensive. So if your salt space is, um, let's see, even, so we have uh, nine characters is 690 gigabytes, yeah. So now if we add a, uh, let's see, even if we add a, uh, let's go with a 16-bit salt. Right? So we have a nine characters plus a 16-bit salt. So that means we'd have to try, basically, we need a 690-gigabyte uh, file uh, times all the different salts, which is 2 to the 16th, uh, which is going to be 2 to the 16th times 690, which we've now pushed the requirements up to 45 petabytes. Right, which is going to be much, much more difficult to actually do. Um, so now we've kind of forced people to give up this rainbow tables idea and actually just brute force each password individually with its given salt. And I think we basically already talked about the salts. Yeah, so a random value that's public, known, added before it's hashed. Um, so yeah, you can think of it in two different ways. So Essentially, each password hash is unique now, and this way, two users having the same password, we won't be able to easily tell just based on the hashes, because they'll have different salts, they will have different uh, hashes. And another way to think about this is having a different F for every uh, user. Questions on salts? <laughs> yeah. How, did they, how would that work like coming back? Because you're so you're adding like a so you're adding a random value before it's hashed, like you're yep. adding a character, and then I guess I'm. And then you have to store that. So this is the key thing. So you have to uh, before in our if we think about our users table in our database, right? We would have a username and password, which would be the hashed password, right? So we have. Uh, user foo has a hash, we store the hash of bar, whatever that password is. Uh, now, in this case, we can't, we need to store the username, the password, and the salt. So, I, username foo would have salt of, we'll just say, uh, one, five, and password would be the hash. So you store that with the password and the username so that that way when they log in, right, 
they log in, you grab the salt from the, they say, okay, which user are you trying to log in? Who? Okay, grab the salt, add that salt to their password, hash it, and then check that with what's stored in the database. And if that's the same, then you're correct. Salt isn't going to be user facing, right? The user right. wouldn't actually see it. The user would never ever see this. It's just something that's used uh, when they log in to make sure that every user has a different uh, password. Or, sorry, every user, if they use the same password, hashes to a different value. Yeah. And then, so for each salt, you need a, uh, like a discrete rainbow table? Yes. Of like in order, exactly. In order to break it, you have to create a rainbow table per salt. Okay. So, yeah, for this one, so this, so if my hash, I'm using MD5, which I shouldn't use because it's a bad hash, but if I use MD5, I would need to use the specific rainbow table that was built based on salt 15. Um, and then somebody else would have salt 16, and then that rainbow table would be completely obsolete. They need a new rainbow table for that specific salt 16. Okay. And this is why then essentially it becomes infeasible to use yeah. rainbow tables because you've made the requirements here so huge that they can't possibly. But that doesn't mean they can't guess your password if they have this, right? They can still do brute force operations because they have the username, the password, and the salt. So they can just try um, for user foo all these combinations here. So they, so they know the salt, they'll just add it and properly guess and check that the hash matches. But the other nice thing is they now need to break each username independently also based on hash. So you can't just guess password foo or your password bar and see exactly who in the database has that same password. You need to do it for every salt as well. All right, more questions? Cool, and then the other super interesting thing we have is, so this is that other aspect we talked about of slow hashes. So we want different hashing operations to be slow. And this is the, um, and to be slow in essentially different ways because we can, like we talked about, uh, we can do hashing on our CPU and we can multi-thread and parallelize that operation. We can use GPUs. Uh, if we really want, we can even build like a, ASIC or a hardware-based machine that all it does is compute uh, MD5 or whatever, and those can operate insanely fast. Um, and so the idea with a slow hash is you have this kind of controllable work factor that determines how much it takes to do that, and you also have a salt and a hash. And so they've now designed different types of hash functions designed specifically to be slow. So decrypt, uh, for example, is a is a slow hash function that when you do it, it takes roughly like a quarter of a second every time you want to compute it. So, and then you can control that work factor of how long it takes. Um, so it's intentionally designed to be slow. Um, I used to use it on my submission server. Yeah, it took about 300 milliseconds. Uh, other interesting things are um, other types of slow hashes, specifically uh, script. So script is another type of hash function that is designed to use a lot of memory. So this is the um, key problem of ASICs, of like hardware-based um, ASICs or FPGAs. Uh, memory is pretty expensive. So if you make it so that ha every hash takes 200 megs of memory, that's kind of out of the range of doing massively parallel on small hardware devices. You're going to force people to use a CPU and maybe a, a GPU if they want to break it. But even then, it takes a long time to actually compute. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a. I really like this because it's a. It's in stark contrast to what we think about and talk about cryptographic primitives. We want them to be literally as fast as possible so everyone can use them. But here, actually being as fast as possible makes the attacker's job easier. So now we need to come up with ways to make the attacker's job more difficult. So we talked
talk about a little bit on this uh, password reuse. Uh, we talked about that we have a lot of different passwords on a lot of different uh, areas. And okay, so yeah, and we'll look at a little bit of like why this is such a big problem. So uh, in 2013, 3.5 billion Yahoo usernames and passwords were leaked. That's a billion with a B people of usernames and passwords were released. So think about now that that is, and I believe it was, uh, I think it's hashes of passwords too, but still as people start breaking them, uh, you can detect these. Uh, and more recent cases, uh, 412 million adult friend finder uh, user accounts were leaked. Uh, Adobe had 152 million, and eBay had uh, 145 million username and hash password release. Uh, so then this is hopefully a good case to show you that it doesn't really matter how big your site is or how many users you have. You should consider your databases, your username and passwords being hacked as an inevitability. Um, this should be a good argument for why you shouldn't store your passwords in plain text, because if you think of the havoc that's going to be caused with 3.5 billion people's username and passwords being uh, leaked at once, um, and the, all of those users, the passwords that they've reused them on on different sites is kind of uh, crazy. Um, so we'll look at the Adobe breach. Uh, very. Uh, and so there's a blog post on the bottom if you want to go check out more about this. Um, and so what they did is try to dig into, um, <laughs> this is always great. Uh, they tried to dig in and understand uh, what the, because usually what you get is just the dump of the passwords. So, of the, sorry, of the database. So here the database, you have user ID, uh, the username, the email address, uh, the password data, which we'll look at in a little bit, which is basically foreign coded and a nice uh, password hint column. Um, so why do services have this like password hint feature? encoded data, which you're all very familiar with now. And oh, this is funny. So this, why didn't anybody notice this? This is somebody said, this is probably their MySpace password. <laughs> and this is their regular password. Um, fascinating. Cool. So what they did is uh, decoded the base 64 data, saw that they were essentially hashes. But weird is that the data wasn't constant size. So you would expect for a hash, that it would be constant size, right? So you do SHA-256, whatever, you get a fixed number of bytes for every single password. But here you had different amounts. So you'd have uh, some password data, these are all in hex when they were decoded. Uh, so you'd have some that were like one, I don't know exactly how long this is, but whatever, some that were two, some that were three. So why is this? They did it in blocks maybe? They did it in blocks. Why do you think they did that? Like a legacy tool had a length requirement, probably. Sure, I, yeah, I believe that, yeah. I thought it was faster to do three smaller hashes. Okay, so 
maybe, um, yeah, let's look at this. So, and look, we can use the password hints a little bit. So you have one, same old, same old. Uh, two that you'll never guess. We have uh, this one that says it's uh, virtuously long. That's a weird way to phrase that. So it seems like the longer the password is, the more of these chunks there are. Yeah. So they're actually not even hashing it, they're encrypting it with some key. And that's how we can see that there's different blocks, right? Because based on the size of their password, if the password is longer than the block size, it'll, it'll have two blocks as an output. And we can also see based on the repetition that they're using uh, ECB mode, not CBC, right? Because that second block should not be the same as the first blocks are different. Right? But we can assume or we can think, well, through this data dump, we don't have the key. So in this case, it actually is the same. So we can stop here and think about what's the difference between hashing passwords and encrypting passwords here. Yeah. Encryption, if you have the key, you can go back. Yeah, so encryption, you have the key, you can go back. So how does that impact it as an authentication mechanism? Yeah. It, if, if you eventually get the key based on someone else's, say, QWERTY123, you can then get everyone's instantly. Ah, the most crypto algorithms we are, uh, I don't know what they're called. Uh, they, so that would be a known plain text attack, but on good crypto algorithms, even if you know the password and the encrypted output, you can't derive the key. Right, like we looked at AES, even if I told you this is QWERTY123 and you have the encrypted version of that, you can't derive the key. Yeah. If the hashes or if the database was leaked, there's a good chance the key was also leaked. Yeah, so if the database was leaked, it's a fairly likely that the key is going to be leaked, right? You have to think that whatever systems are running these, the application needs to have access to the key in order to log you in, right? Because it has to do the login, so it has to encrypt your password with the key and then compare it in here. So the application needs access to the key. So likely if somebody has access to this database, they probably have access to the key too. Uh, what is the benefit of doing this? Yeah. It feels like maybe they were decrypting the store date, the stored data at runtime for some reason. Yeah, when would they want to do that? They wouldn't have a chance to do that if it's decrypting is faster than encrypting. <coughs> That would an application want to decrypt your password? Yeah. To send you the password reset. To send you the password reset, right? Because they said, aha, well, we're not storing plain text passwords, right? Because that's dumb. Uh, but we want users to be able to get their password if we need to reset their password so we don't change it. We can send it to them in an email and remind them of their password. Uh, we can do that this way, but now we have this problem of if somebody breaks into our system. I don't know the original people who broke in, but it would be a good chance that they probably stole that key or could steal the key depending on how, you know, it makes it, I would say it's above uh, plain text passwords in the sense that you need to, the attack needs to do a little bit more work in order to steal that key, but uh, it doesn't mean that it's impossible to steal the key. Um, so it's a super interesting design decision, but it's, hashing is strictly better. Also it means that any Adobe person who has access to that key can decrypt all the passwords, right? Which was, the, again, the other thing we wanted to prevent with plain text passwords. Um, so this is maybe one type of design solution, but hashing, and specifically slow hashing, is much, much better. Um, yeah? Do you know what the key was? For I do not know what the key was. I don't know if it's known, actually. Uh, but we can look at this a little bit, and we can see... Um, yeah, so we can look at the count here and we can see that the password data length is, uh, this must be in bytes, so eight bytes, 16, 24, 32. 
And then going forward, uh, we can think that we can look, and, and the other thing is now that there's no salts in encryption, right? Because they're not using CBC, they're not using a random initialization vector. So all of the, so that means 1.6% of people in this data set of, uh, what was it? Uh, 162 million, so 1%, 1 percent, 1.6% of those people all use the same password because their password data was exactly the same. So now we have the problem of that this crypto, if you're just encrypting the password, you also need to worry about salts and other types of things. Um, so you have 1.6% all use the same uh, data value, 0.45 use the second, uh, third was 0.44%. And so what we can use is we can use super cool. So we can maybe try to figure out what these passwords are, but we actually do have an interesting thing where we can't brute force it because we don't have the key, right? But we do know all these people have the same password. So we can use data. This is from the um, Rock U data set, which was 188,000 passwords that were leaked without any hashing. So we know the passwords. So we can compute on this data set, the most frequent password was one, two, three, four, five, six. The second one was password. The third was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which is really funny. Why is it not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? <laughs> Why the two more, I guess people think is much better, but they end up all using it. Uh, the fourth one is life hack, which is very interesting. So why do you think that's the fourth most here? Was that a forum there maybe? It was the name of the site that got hacked, yeah. So the, the <laughs> thing was called life hack. So that's what people use as their password. Next was QWERTY. A, B, C, one, two, three, and just uh, six ones. Um, and so kind of using that, you can actually look at, you can group all of the accounts that have the same password data and look at the password hints. Now this is, again, where now having this password hint gives the attacker a lot of information. Uh, because you can see all these people that have this one is numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and three of them said that, like they, they each say exactly what that is. So just with that, with, so it's not, and the interesting thing is it's not even one person, right? So it's the fact that without salting, we know that everyone, 1.6% of users have the same password and it only takes one of them to have what the password is in their hint. And then now we know we've broken, uh, What's that, a million people out of 146, at least a million people's passwords we know was one, two, three, four, five, six on Adobe. Um, we can look at other ones. So this next one, uh, which was this 8FBA, is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, we can see some people, the third most frequent one, which is this one, is the password is password. Uh, this other one, E5D8, said, it's QWERTY, and so it looks like from this example that their system didn't allow you to put the password in as the actual password. So what did they do? They just added spaces in between their password. Um, and QWERTY was the uh, fourth most used one. And then the next one was six ones, one times six. Uh, six ones, so this was one, 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 one. So it actually matches up really nicely with other data breaches. So this is a clear example of people uh, kind of choosing the same password and kind of what you can, what, like a real authentication system needs, is and we can understand what it is by looking at this data dump and kind of thinking through that. Any questions on this? Yeah. So what would make the, if you see two and three, like the second half, the hash, the encryption is the same. So like, is that a function of the algorithm itself? In this part here? Or are you yeah. talking about uh, this part here? So this part would tell me that they're using um, encryption, that they're using ECB mode, so they're encrypting it chunk by chunk, and that just means the second chunk is exactly the same. So just like the penguin picture we saw, right? So it, uh, we don't know exactly what that chunk is yet until we break it, but we know exactly what that, that chunk is the same as the other chunk. Um, so like it may have been, because we actually just, I don't know, Let's see, this is the E2, A3, 707. Yeah, so we actually know from this, it's one through eight, and we know one through six is one block, so that's either seven, eight, or just eight. The 
Oh, interesting. Uh, that rhymes with password, though. That's funny. <laughs> right, don't that. Um, it is. Okay, so then in this case, it must be. Yeah, okay, this makes sense. Uh, we didn't get into this, but this is the padding. So the password uh, must be. What is it? Password is eight characters? Yeah, so it's eight characters. It fits up exactly one block, but you need padding to tell you that. So you have another block that's all padding. So that must be exactly what this is. So all of them that have that block are exactly the length of that input. Yeah. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's no padding. Which one? The one above it. That one's only six long. Right? Yeah, so it's only six long, so it has padding at the end, so it doesn't need an extra block for padding. Yeah, yeah. So it's only one, so anyone that's exactly eight characters should have that same last block. Okay. Cool. Okay. So some things then we can think about, and we uh, people have already been talking about this a little bit, is other techniques and approaches we can maybe use to try to uh, detect this. So, uh, what is a password manager? Yeah. So maybe your browser uh, can store your passwords for you. It can maybe actually make a password for you, generate a random password for you. Um, there's other companies that do this, uh, LastPass, OnePass, KeePass, I actually don't know all of them, but some of them, they, they may use any other ones that I haven't mentioned. Password. What was it? One password. One password, yeah. Firefox has an integrated password manager. Yeah, Firefox has one, Chrome has one, Safari definitely has one that spans both the uh, mobile and the web. Uh, what else? KeyPass, uh, open source one, I believe, right? Sort of? Yeah. Dashlane. Dashlane, yeah, that's the other one I remember. Okay, cool. So what's the benefit here? You never have to actually know what the password is because it's something random. What else? Yeah. Passwords can be really complicated. Yeah, passwords can literally be, so rather than a password that you have to remember, it can actually be randomly drawn from that old eight. 260 billion or trillion possibilities, right? We can generate um, random bits and then transform that to a password, and then we have a super complex password for every everything is possible. Yeah. Um, password managers can like send you notices if um, they find out that there's been a data breach, or they mm. can warn you if you're trying if you're reusing a password. They might warn you so that you think, oh, I shouldn't do that. To use a different yeah, so maybe they can actually help you with your password hygiene, because if they have access to all your passwords, they can say, hey, you're using the same password on multiple accounts, maybe go change it and change your password. Yeah, or maybe check if, you're, if your password has been used in a breach, so maybe change that password. Yeah. Is that a real phrase? Is what? Is that a phrase, password hygiene? Uh, I don't know. I think I may have just made it up. But that sounds <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure somebody's said it before me. Super annoying, right? Uh, then 
either the app has to handle it, right, of syncing between your mobile device and your desktop or laptop and other devices that you own. Um, yeah, now you have multiple copies of your thing. How does it deal with conflict, sync? website and this then the next level that's what we talked about a little bit is that should be then encrypted or locked with a master password right um, so what do you think good things bad things yeah um i think one thing with password managers is they make um like this is a weird thing to say but they make death easier to handle like if someone dies and you know their master password you can access all their accounts which is helpful yeah, so, um, yeah, no, that's actually a legit, legitimate concern, right? So, um, yeah, if you have in a safe somewhere written down your master password, and or you can give it to an attorney that can be given the next of kin uh, when you die or whatever, uh, you can actually give access to somebody to all of your accounts, which can be useful, yeah. Yeah? I don't know anything like, I don't know why this is, but when um, I try to open my password manager in Chrome, prompts me for my computer's password. Hmm. Windows prompts you for, for your Windows password. Maybe it's storing it as a higher level administrator user, so that way no other apps <coughs> will be able to get to it unless they're also admin apps. I don't know the direct uh, implementation details. That's, I guess, strictly better than it used to be, where it was just stored as a file on your computer, so if anybody seals it, you can get access to it. So ideally, you'd hope that your, your password code so what's the risk of putting all your passwords in one place? Yeah. If your like master password gets found out, yeah. So if anybody breaks in using your master password, it's done for. Uh, what else? Yeah. If you don't sync and you lose whatever machine or device that was on, you're in for a rough ride. Yeah. So if you don't have any backups, right? And you, um, yeah, exactly. So if you lose access to either, so. Password manager is just storing a local file that's encrypted with your master password, and you have no way to access those backups, or you haven't backed it up, and your machine goes out the door. Uh, you think you will have a very bad time. So I have to go reset the password and everything. Yeah. You have to trust your password manager a lot. Yeah. So should you trust them? So why do you need to trust them a lot? I like that. Yeah, they go out of business and then what? So then you're relying on them for your passwords, they go out of business, what else? What are some other threats? They could get breached, right? So they're storing your, you think about putting a big target on your back, if you're the site that stores everyone's passwords, that's a pretty big target, right? So they could get breached, all their passwords could get stolen, what else? Yeah. Most of them are online services, 
know that they don't have access to your passwords. Right? So yeah, it's maybe encrypted with your master password, but how do you know they're not storing your master password somewhere? Right? You're literally typing into their software every time you unlock your account, your password account. Uh, what about, yeah, so there's that, there's, they could, uh, so think about compromise, not just could somebody compromise their data, but somebody could compromise their app so that when you type in your master password, it sends your password to an attacker, right? Or any kind of autofill, it sends passwords to an attacker, right? So not only do you have to trust them, you have to trust their software distribution, you have to trust their backup policy, you have to trust that they're going to stay in business. So what do you think? Good things? Bad things? Yeah. Um, I know one password has let a lot of security researchers like look over what they are doing and try to break it, see if they can break it, mm -hmm. which I think is helpful, obviously, for building trust. Yeah, and increasing your assurance, right? Uh, other ways you can look at how they actually do things. So um, for instance, I, I'm more familiar with last because that's the one I use, but their whole, you can look and read about their encryption scheme where basically your entire password list is encrypted with your master password, and that's, they store this encrypted log, so if somebody hacks in without your master password, they can't read anything, right? So, uh, you know, you kind of, you're, again, still there's trust. You're trusting them that they're not accidentally leaking it or whatever. Um, you can also look at how they've responded to incidents, like uh, security researchers finding bugs and vulnerabilities, which definitely happens. How do they deal with that, handle that? Um, uh, other things to think about is, so yeah, you're, so it's definitely a trade-off, and I guess, so what do you think, is it a <coughs> worthwhile trade-off? now remember one password and if it's only one password you have to remember you actually can make that probably pretty hard for mm -hmm. a computer to guess right um, and then every other account is now secure yeah so in some sense so it's a trade-off right between this problem of unguessable passwords per website like creating a unique password per website you're trading that off with one password that controls your password database uh, that you have access to it's also better than some people talk about creating a, a file on their machine with their passwords, um, which could be a, a good alternative, but this is a little bit better because it can be encrypted and all kinds of stuff, so it's actually extra protection on top of that. Yeah. Um, I actually, I personally really like the strategy of adapting a base password mm -hmm. to the site using like parts of the URL, and I would actually rather do that than use a password manager. Yeah, that's uh, so. Yeah, it's definitely different types of trade-offs. The trade-off there would be uh, if you told somebody your algorithm, or if uh, let's say one or two of your passwords leaked in like plain text, a dedicated attacker could probably figure out your algorithm and then maybe break the rest of the sites. Would be the the one downside of that approach. So it's, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely different trade-offs. Definitely trade-offs, so we'll stop here. Thanks.